I want to uh, start out by um, explaining the question we, we have before us. Um, this seems to be, uh, and I'm, uh, I've written a couple books on logic, so I'm not entirely ignorant of the subject, and uh, it seems to me the, the logical place to start. If you're going to be a classical educator, you're uh, going to be engaged in the act of classical education, you ought to know what it is. And so it's it's sort of like if you're um, if you're coaching a, a football team, you know the coach sometimes has to say, "This is a football." That's that's kind of what we're doing here. Because so it's kind of interesting. What I have found over the years is that um, it, it's sort of like the old story of of um, the blind man and the elephant, uh, which is. Uh, which has it that uh, there were there were a, a several uh, blind men and they come across an elephant and they all start arguing about what the elephant is or, or, or what the elephant is like anyway. And so one of the blind men grabs his tail and he says, well, an elephant is like a broom. And another of the blind men uh, uh, touches the leg and says, well, the elephant's like a tree. And they all go around, they all have different parts of the elephant but no one can actually agree as to exactly what the elephant is like because they're all sort of grabbing hold of different uh, parts of it. So part of the purpose for this talk today is to uh, uh, simply enlighten us blind men and women uh, on the issue of what it is. I find that there's a, a, there are a lot of classical educators. There are a lot of classical administrators who have a hard time explaining what it is. So really, they're, they're in a sense, are, are two purposes to this webinar today. One is to explain it to ourselves, to really uh, gain an understanding ourselves as to what exactly it is that, that, uh, that we are engaged in, and to gain uh, an, un, an, uh, an understanding uh, that is good enough so that we can actually explain it to other people. All right. Now let, let's let's start out with with a um, just an observation. Okay, if we were to go back, say 150, 200 years, to a good school, say in the United States, what exactly would we find? All right. Now l let's let's give a context here. This would be in the context of, uh, of a world of education that didn't know anything other than classical education. You know, today we talk about all these, you know, different options and methodologies of teaching and education and all of that. That is a very recent phenomenon. That only starts really, uh, the discussion starts in the middle of the 19th century, but we only get this mentality um, at the beginning of the 20th century. So I'm talking about before that, when the only concept anyone had was of classical education. Um, and and um, the it was called that, actually. It was called classical education, but it was mostly just called education. Okay, there weren't a bunch of options. This is what education was. So this school that we have uh, imagined um, that, a, that is existing 150 years ago, 200 years ago, a good school, not the little school on the prairie who didn't have a Latin master, um, would have shanghaied them and, and forced them to stay if, they, if, he, if he'd been going through town. Um, I'm talking about a, a, a good school. What we would find is, is this. We would find a school engaged in reading the great books uh, in their original languages. That's what we would find. We have to remember, first of all, that the great books, um, number one, were written in primarily, almost exclusively, two languages, uh, those being Latin and Greek. And we didn't have all the translations that we have today uh, in, into English. Those really come about in the late 19th century. We get the first um, uh, widely read English translations of the great books. 
So, uh, so this required then that the student learn Latin and Greek for purely instrumental reasons, namely to read these books that they're supposed to be reading that are not in translation. So that's what a good school was doing. That was the, that was the system of education. Now, again, there are many schools that can't find a Latin teacher um, that are in um, uh, uh, rural areas you know, on, the, on the frontier. Uh, you know, things, you just had to do things the way you had to do them. But the ideal, and everyone knew this, was to, uh, to know the, the classical languages and to, um, and to uh, be able to translate and read the great, great works of Western civilization. This uh, this goes on uh, into the you know this 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 goes on from from ancient times uh, to the Middle Ages uh, to um, the uh, Puritan settlement of of America and you know the Puritans are the ones who start uh, a lot of the Ivy League schools Harvard and Princeton and and all these schools they're all classical and thoroughly classical institutions um, the founding fathers what what education they had that wasn't self-education. So we're not talking about Benjamin Franklin here, for example, who, who professed to have a low view of Latin, but used a, a whole lot of it in Poor Richard's Almanac, I notice. Uh, but he was self-taught primarily. Um, but if you were schooled in any way, you, um, you got this classical education. You were trained in Latin and Greek. Uh, the, the founding fathers uh, all were trained to some extent this way. And, you know, many didn't get far enough down the road to be reading the classics in the original languages. George Washington, for example, has to quit school in the eighth grade because his father dies. So he only gets, uh, the father of our country only had an eighth grade education. Um, he, we would think that'd be a frightening thought, only he did a terribly good job on the basis of that uh, eighth grade education he got um, in, uh, in the founding period of the United States. If you want to see it in full flower, uh, look at uh, John Adams, the correspondence between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Um, the, the Latin expressions, the Greek expressions that were fired off at each other in these letter exchanges. Um, and uh, to the point where the Adams of, Adams of Jefferson, way too many Greek, Greek uh, um, quotations in his letters. So, uh, but these people were thoroughly classically educated. This goes on through the um, the 19th century. Um, and it's only in the 19th century you start getting questions about whether this system of classical education that we're going to define in a moment um, really starts to to be questioned. Um, I The first instance I've seen of this, I, w I happened to be reading Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, um, uh, maybe the best novel ever written. I mean, it's good. And there's a dinner conversation in Tolstoy's novels. You know, there's all these dinner conversations in aristocratic households. And one of them was on education. And it was a debate um, between several of the characters on classical education versus modern education. And what modern education meant at the end of the 19th century was uh, vocational training, primarily. You know, why are these, these, we start getting these questions, why are we doing Latin and Greek when, you know, a lot of people don't need that for the practical things they're doing in life? That, that becomes the question. Um, so at the end of the 19th century, we get John Dewey, who is concerned about social reform. This is part of the progressivist era in American history. We're reforming everything. This is what Dewey comes out of. And so a big debate happens in the early uh, two decades of the 20th century about classical education. And um, the progressives win uh, almost completely. By the 1920s, all of the institutions, the teachers' colleges, the um, teachers' unions um, are, are progressive. If you want to see this actually in action, read, you know, Harper Lee is much in the news right now because of this, uh, um, this Comes a Watchman um, uh, book. And, um, but if you, if you go to To Kill a Mockingbird, which I understand, I haven't read the new one, is a far superior book. You will find in chapters two and four an account uh, from Scout, the protagonist's perspective, of the 
new education coming into her rural Alabama school district in the 1930s. And it's all this Deweyite progressivism that has already gone, you know, been established in a lot of the city schools. It's come out to the rural counties now. And you get this very funny uh, perspective on these new education techniques and, a, and many of them, you know, cooperative, you know, all the things you learn in teacher's college, cooperative learning, um, uh, uh, you know, working, working in groups, uh, projects, uh, unit studies, all this stuff is there. It's already there in the 20s. Everything that has happened since the 20s. Well, there's one thing that did, did, did change from the 20s. You get that. And then in the 40s, you get this real heavy vocational emphasis in education. Education all of a sudden becomes uh, something that you do to get a job. Okay. Uh, whereas the old classical ideal had been to become a well-educated individual so you could do any job we get into this idea that we need to to engage start engaging in specific job skills training it, it really narrows what uh, the conception of what education is so you have dewey's idea that education the purpose of education is to change the culture he's a he's a he's a political social reformer then you get in the 40s what what was called at that time the life adjustment movement which is basically vocational education. Uh, the idea there is to fit the child to the culture, something Dewey didn't like. I mean, the Progressive Education Association that was founded on the basis of Dewey's ideas gets turned into this vocational education thing. It's no longer primarily the social political reform thing Dewey wanted in his culture, the progressivist ideal, and using schools to fit children to the culture, the pragmatic idea have dominated education philosophy to this day and everything that has happened since the 40s has just been a rehash of that uh, all the education reform proposals we see are always a rehash of the ideas furthering those two goals well what was the goal of the old classical education the old goal of the old classical education was not to change the culture it wasn't to uh, fit children to the culture it was to pass on a culture specifically uh, Western civilization, Western civilization. Um, the word classical in its, in its very literal form is um, it always referred to the cultures of Athens and Rome. That was what it meant. And it, it, of course, it was taken in the, in the, um, uh, the late Roman Empire uh, with uh, uh, Augustine, and uh, and by the medievals and, and all through that period, uh, it was in many way, uh, ways uh, Christianized, at least to the extent that it, you know, it could be used in, in Christian education. Um, that's what Western civilization was for many years. And even up until the, the 20s, when we had classical education, you had, it was an emphasis on the, on the, on the, the culture of Athens. Um, where does this start? Well, if you go back, actually, I think the, the earliest state, Phoenix is Achilles' teacher. He's a sort of human stand-in for um, the, the legendary centaur Chiron, who in Greek legend was the, the character who, who, was, who taught, who was the master uh, of many of the great heroes. Uh, Achilles, uh, in, in legend, is, is one of them. Um, many others, Hercules. Um, but Homer, you know, is writing his history of the Trojan War. And so uh, Phoenix is, is sort of the human stand-in for the, for the old uh, wise centaur. And there's this crisis in Achilles' life, of which, of course, if we read the Iliad, we know there are many. And, uh, and he and what to do. That is the first statement I have, I, I have been able to find of what the purpose of education is. How to speak and what to do. Now, we can actually change the speak thing a little bit. I, I universalize it uh, a little bit because I think this would have captured the meaning of, of Phoenix and any Greek educator and say that, um, how, say instead, how to think and what to do. Now, the um, the you know thought is just the flip side of speech, and vice versa. 
right? You can't speak unless you can think. Your speaking is just the expression of your thoughts. So I, I always say it, how to speak and what to do, all right? Now, how do we do that? How, how, is, how is that done? If you look at how to think, of course, that's a very predominant theme in modern, in, in even modern education, isn't it? Uh, don't we hear a lot of talk about um, critical thinking skills, all right? I mean, I hear that all the time, critical thinking skills. But the, the problem is, and I was on a debate about uh, an education issue on uh, statewide TV last year, and I was debating the House Education Committee chairman and the um, and a professor in um, from a uh, he's a science professor from um, Western Kentucky University, and we were actually talking about the science standards, and you know, I was pointing out some of the problems with those. Um, one of which was there's very little content actually in um, in the the federal science standards. I was pointing out the problem here, and his his re response was interesting. He said, "Well, um, what we're trying to do, we're not trying to teach kids what to think. We're we're trying to teach them uh, critical thinking skills." So I asked, "Well, you know, what do you mean by that? You hear that term all the time. You would assume." that people who use it know what it means. <laughs> As it turns out, uh, and I have yet to run across anyone who uses that term in the education world who has a coherent explanation of what they mean by that. And it's because it has become a sort of uh, cheerleading term, a promotional term. And so, you know, when you ask a, uh, an educator who uses that term, uh, what do you mean? You get a blank stare. Uh, it's sort of like asking, um, sort of like stopping a cheerleader, a cheer, cheerleader in the middle of her routine, saying, "Excuse me, but when you say rah rah sis boom ba, exactly what do you mean?" You know, they've stopped shaking their pom poms and they have to. And of course, it doesn't mean anything. It just means you know, rah rah education. Um, and um, and so, really, if you go back to look at the old classical way of doing things, what you will find is that there was a coherent critical thinking skills program. This is the thing that classical educators do not realize: is that they are the only ones with a coherent classical or the, a coherent critical thinking skills program. In fact, it's interesting that 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 expression, critical thinking skills. It only arises at the point when you don't have them anymore. People didn't use critical the term critical thinking skills until fairly recently. All right, you go back to even the forties, you know, or any earlier than that, you don't ever see this term. Why? You don't see it because schools still have this, even though classical education has kind of been defeated by the progressives and the pragmatists early on in the twentieth century. It's still, you know, they haven't changed it totally. There's still an idea of the liberal arts. Now here's an expression that we might well look at and ask, liberal arts, now how does that fit into the whole classical education scheme? Well, it fits in very uh, intimately because it is the first aspect of the, of the first of the two aspects, uh, the two parts of what classical education is, okay? Uh, I said how to think and what to do. Well, uh, that sort of matches, and, if, and, and let me back up just a little bit, and I'll get back to this point about critical thinking skills and the liberal arts. But um, the uh, when you take the how to think and what to do, that matches up very closely with an expression I have seen, which is, and if you want to put down the first definition of classical education, this is the sort of philosophical definition of classical education. So get your get your uh, uh, pad of paper out, and write this down. It is wisdom and virtue okay classical education is the inculcation of wisdom and virtue and uh, as andrew kern my friend at the circe institute likes to say through a meditation on the good the true and the beautiful the inculcation of wisdom and virtue 
through the meditation on the good, the true, and the beautiful. Now, I throw that one out first because, because um, I, I can imagine some of the viewers of this webinar saying, well, that's, that's a nice philosophical definition, but what do I do with that? Okay, I'm going to get to that. But, but if we start lofty at first, we'll move down to the more practical level. That is really what we're about, okay? And, and learning how to think is uh, an essential aspect, isn't it, of, of having wisdom. Um, Thomas Aquinas once said that uh, that man is wise who orders things rightly, what classical education is. So, uh, so we have the liberal arts to do this. What are the liberal arts? Well, the old accounting of the seven liberal arts, and I'm going to talk about the first three tomorrow, the, the classical trivium, and this idea we have in modern classical education of stages of learning and all that. I'm not going to talk about that here. So I'll be talking about that tomorrow at uh, 12 Eastern time here at, at that webinar. But what the liberal arts are is a set of generalizable intellectual skills that, that apply to anything. No matter what you do in life, these are the basic intellectual skills that you, the the first three of the liberal arts, the trivium, which in Latin means three ways, are all linguistic skills: grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Uh, of those, on those first three, we we study grammarfully understanding on your end. This thing we use all day, every day, in our home life, in our recreation, in our business, in our education profession, whatever it is, language is the primary thing. To be able to understand how it works is hugely important. This was one of the understandings of the old classical education, to understand how language works. You studied Latin grammar. You studied Greek grammar. And by doing that, you learned about the grammar of your own language, which, since we are English speakers, is hidden in many ways. Uh, English is a very irregular language. It has lots of idiomatic expressions. It doesn't have an organized noun and adjective system. It's very hard to understand grammar in, in English. And if you're an English speaker, you have the added disadvantage that, that, that you assume all this stuff about 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 uh, speaking and writing, and it's hard to back in to the structure of that thing you already use every day. You need something that you don't use every day to see language more objectively. You need a foreign language. I really stress this. You really need a foreign language. Um, any foreign language is better than no foreign language. I think that when I graduated from high school, the only grammar I knew was from my Spanish class. I don't, I don't think I ever learned much of anything in English, but, but, but Spanish is different. I had to unlock it. I had to use tools to 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 look at this thing, and with something outside of me that I could observe, rather than having back in having to back into these abstractions in English grammar that are very difficult, very abstract. Uh, English grammar, in a sense, uh, uh, our our publisher Cheryl Lowe once once wrote an article called, called "No Grammar in the Grammar Stage," <laughs> meaning no English grammar in the grammar stage. This is a very abstract subject. Um, you're you're dealing with kids more on a concrete level. Uh, it, it's actually better to use a foreign language. Now, the foreign language you would want to use is an inflected foreign language. What does that mean? It means a a language where the noun endings change. You, you in in a in an inflected foreign language, you don't you don't look to see where the word is in a sentence to figure out object form. The word with an ending that tells you just by looking at the word, not knowing where it is in the sentence, just by looking at the word, what it's doing in the sentence. It's very much a grammar language in that. Ours is a syntactical language. Everything's word order. Uh, inflected languages are, are grammar languages because the grammar is embedded in the word itself. And so you learn noun declensions. Didn't have to learn those in Spanish because Spanish doesn't, Spanish is also non-inflected. French is non-inflected. A lot of modern languages are non-inflected. They don't have this, this aspect to them that, that, that requires you to learn the grammar in order to do them. You can't get away. You can get away with those other languages not knowing the grammar of nouns, and that we can't do that in an inflected language, like Latin, Greek, German, Russian, Czechoslovakian. Um, you know, uh, all the all the all the ancient languages were inflected. Modern languages have lost their inflections 
There's probably a reason for that. I don't know what it is. Um, but so you need an inflected foreign language. That's the best way to learn grammar. And there's one more thing. You want a regular inflected foreign language. I'm, I mean, a language where the rules that you're taught almost always apply. There's not a bunch of exceptions and idiom a lot, a lot of idiomatic expressions. Latin is the most regular inflected foreign language. Um, it's a safe little grammar world in which if you apply the rules, at least at the beginning, you know, it, it is it, it, it does have irregularities, you know, when you get into the more complex aspect of it. But early on, when your students are young, they're 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 and they're learning what grammar is, how language works, it's a safe little grammar world in which they can operate. So Latin was always the primary um, uh, language in classical education. Greek was always secondary because I think they realized that 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 regularity, you know, you, of Latin, that you could see the structure of language in its most pristine form in Latin. That was that was what people, uh, what educators, kind of uh, uh, even sometimes I think implicitly knew, and so so Latin was always uh, first in the order, which is why you know we always stress the importance of Latin as your really your core language arts study in the same way that math is your core math science study. Latin and math uh, is how we do the liberal arts. Um, and of course you have logic, which is the, the structure of rational thought, the, the rules of argumentation. And then you have rhetoric, which is uh, the rules of persuasion. There are actually ways to do this that are pretty objective. Uh, people think of language as being subjective, not in the old classical education. It was objective. Grammar, there's a universal grammar that all languages observe. We have the subject-object way of thinking that is reflected in our language. Uh, it's 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 uh, even even learning grammar is a thinking skills subject, okay, just as much as uh, as logic is uh, or rhetoric. Um, it's it's how your language works. It's the structure of your thought. You, the way you think is is uh, determined uh, by your language, which is why, you know, different languages come from different cultures that think differently. You know, that's one of the other values of classical education is when you do go back and actually read these these um, uh, these books in, in original languages, you're learning the way the Romans thought, which is very different from the way we, we think. We're learning the way the Greeks thought, again, which is very different. Uh, they have, have a lot of that kind of value. On the other side of the liberal arts is math. People don't, when people hear liberal arts, I think they, they're thinking humanities, English and history and, and, and philosophy and all this stuff. The liberal arts was language and math, okay? Math is a liberal arts subject. Four, a majority of the seven liberal arts are considered mathematical. Arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Now, we modern people with our very scientific bent and look at music and astronomy in there and we say why are those in there well the reason they're in there actually is because uh, arithmetic is the theory of discrete number one two three um and music is the application of discrete number the, they they had a little bit wider view of music or harmony uh that they, they probably more than actual music that you play they meant music theory okay and, and then you had geometry. Geometry is the theory of a uh, continuous number. And astronomy is the application of continuous number. Now, David Mulroy, who wrote an excellent book, it's actually one of the best books on classical education, even though that's not what it's intended to be, called The War Against Grammar, says that if it makes you feel better, you can think of the, the quadrivium, the four ways, the mathematical uh, of the liberal arts, the last four, uh, geometry, uh, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. You can you can think in terms of arithmetic. You say uh, arithmetic, geometry, algebra, and calculus. If that makes you feel better, right? Those are the basis of of all modern science. And all modern science um, comes from either arithmetic or geometry. Uh, I am told by the mathematician people, um, of which I am not one. But they tell I. That's what I hear. Uh, all modern science comes from arithmetic or geometry, those first two of the quadrivium, the last four of the liberal arts. Them's thinking skills, okay? So when anyone asks you about thinking, so what is your thinking skills? You say the liberal arts, 
the generalizable intellectual skills that your child will need when he does anything, right? You know, because most schools are teaching, they're trying to teach specific uh, things that are specifically applicable to the, well, the uh, number one schools don't do that very well. Um, they don't have a good conception of what the economy needs. Uh, and so they don't, they don't really predict what, you know, when, when I was in school, they were teaching us uh, 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 Fortran and, and, and Pascal computer languages, C++. And they, uh, I am told by, 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 again, the math people that those languages were going out by the time we graduated. So if I had gone into computer science, I would have been uh, not, not real well suited in specific job skills. I would have been better off taking logic because all computer programming languages are based on logic. You see, so so when anyone asks you philosophical definition, the practical definition we've given the first part of it is the liberal arts and the great books. The liberal arts and the great books. The liberal arts and the best that has been thought and said. All right. Now you're gaining all these thinking skills in in studying the liberal arts, math and language. Um, what are you gaining from the, the humanities. Uh, I said the great books. It's largely history and literature. Well, number one, remember we said wisdom and virtue. Primarily, you get virtue from good examples. In the classical way of, of teaching history, history, you were learning the great deeds of great men. Even in literature, you were doing that. You were learning the great deeds of great men and women, uh, we, we would say now. Um, their models. Um, the best book on character education that I've ever seen is one called Why Johnny Can't Tell Right from Wrong by William Kilpatrick. Why Johnny Can't Tell Right from Wrong, William Kilpatrick. And he makes this point. He says, you know, we have these, these um, uh, family life and parenting programs and sex education programs and uh, um, and, and drug education programs that, that emphasize either emotion or this rationalist approach, and we just throw dilemmas at children, moral dilemmas at children. They're supposed to figure it out. Well, he says, though, number one, those don't work. And he said, number two, what we used to, look at what we used to do in teaching character to children, you know, this, this virtue ideal. Um, we would have them read stories where there were good people and there were bad people. And we were implicitly drawn to the good people. And we were implicitly repelled by the bad people. He said, in, the, in, in, in modern programs like this, you get the, the lifeboat example, you know? And, and you're told, well, you got five people in the lifeboat and, and there's only food for four, so you gotta throw somebody over. And, you know, you're given a description of each one, the accountant, you know, the lawyer, uh, the teacher, the, you know, and, and they always end up throwing the lawyer overboard. I don't know why. Uh, no. I don't know that for sure, but um, but the you know and they're supposed to decide which one to throw. What does that do for you? It doesn't really do anything for you. He said, contrast that with the movie A Night to Remember. That was the original Titanic movie before Titanic with Leonardo DiCaprio, and it was far less sappy, I will say as well. Um, and in that movie. You saw the crew, the captain and the crew, going down with the ship. And you admired them for it. And then you saw the guy sneaking aboard one of the lifeboats dressed as a woman, because they were putting the women and children on the boats, dressed up as a woman. And you reviled that person. It was a part of the idea of training the affections. What you want to do in terms of character education is to teach your children how to love the good. And the best way to do that is by giving them attractive examples of good people um, and unattractive examples of bad people. And if you want to teach about racism in your school, don't get some political program. Read To Kill a Mockingbird. That's the way to do it. It's far more effective because it's going to capture their hearts. Okay, um, you know we 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 want to we want to uh, you know try to convince kids intellectually uh, on things like that, or 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 uh, simply try to play with their emotions. 
get to the what the the ancients would have called the spirit of the person, the the chest. C.S. Lewis once said of the person. Um, that's where we make these decisions. That's that's where we learn to love the good and and hate the evil. That's the way to do it. Um, so uh, so in in history and literature, you're not only learning, you know, how we got to where we are. Um, uh, why we think the way we think. Um, we're not only learning our heritage, our cultural heritage, which is not popular with some people today, unfortunately. Um, we're learning how to be good through history and literature. So classical education is the liberal arts and the great books. How to think and what to do. Um, and hopefully, you know, if that if that wisdom virtue idea is too lofty for you, uh, and and would sound too lofty if you used it to explain to other people what classical education was, uh, you can use the liberal arts and the great books example, um, and 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 you know learn. You need to try to learn how to explain, you know, that these liberal these language and math skills. This is what this is what we do. Um, why aren't you doing STEM education? Well, we're doing math for one thing. Okay. But you know, even most um, tech companies, did you know that in most tech companies, most of the employees are not tech people? Uh, most of the employees are in, in two parts of the company, customer service and marketing. Okay, what are they using? They're not using tech skills. They may use some, but they're not, they're not tech skills that you need a college degree or, or a, a, a formal education to know. Um, it's just using computers and the soft, the nice software that makes it so that you don't have to be a computer programmer. That's that's been the big innovation in in technology in recent years. Is 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 the the the, the greatest innovation in technology in recent years is enabling the rest of us not to have to know how to write it, you know. So, but what they do need to know is language skills. They need to know people. If you read great literature, you will begin to know people, and you will know how to better deal. With people, which most jobs have have something to do with that, don't don't they? Um, you know, if you just study Shakespeare and Dickens, you, you got 80, 90 percent of personality types down. My wife and I joke about it all the time. Mrs. Jellybee, you know, Mr. Guppy. Uh, yeah, you you get all the character types. You get to know people better, and it enables you to deal with them uh, much much more easily. Okay, all right. Well, now we enter the the unknown zone because we haven't done this before. It is uh, time for your comments. Um, I'm going to open this up. I said I'd leave at least 20 minutes. No, I didn't do quite that. Um, so um, if you are on YouTube, the comment section is open there for your questions. Um, again, uh, I am told that on the lower right-hand corner, do I see it here? Uh, well, I don't see it, but I'm assured you should see um, a, um, a Google Hangouts um, link for our Google Hangouts. But uh, again, those of you on YouTube, I don't know how many are on. Um, I know that there are, we have uh, 27 people watching. That I think there's a couple classes. Uh, or uh, uh, groups of teachers who are watching, so it's, uh, it's more people than that. But if you have a comment, a question, now's the time to post it on there. Um, again, uh, I think this is a question that a lot of us don't know how to answer. Um, some of us want to answer the question, what is classical education? By answering, oh, it's it's the it's Dorothy Sayers' three stages of learning. Um, remember, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. I I I think that 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 is a great innovation in terms of uh, of how children learn, uh, of um, of uh, sort of based kind of on an, an idea of her uh, Dorothy Sayers' idea of child development, but that wasn't actually a part of the old classical education. Uh, the, her Dorothy Sayers is a methodology on how children and when children learn certain things the best. It's great. Um, we need to utilize that. 
Um, but I think we need to be careful not to view that as the sum and substance of what classical education is. Um, so, so I think we need to be careful of that. Um, and, uh, and then I think some people want to view it as the, I know that there are some people, uh, Susan Bauer's book, The Well-Trained Mind, uh, really emphasizes uh, this idea of teaching history chronologically. And so some people view classical education as being made up essentially of uh, teaching history chronologically. Well, I, I'm, and I bet, I'm sure Susan would, would uh, I know Susan, I'm sure she would say that, that that's not a complete definition of classical education. Um, that's one way to do it. It's one very legitimate way to do it. Um, we don't, by the way, do that, and it's it's not any anything um, negative on Susan's book at all, because uh, a lot of people do it. They have success doing that. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is one of the uh, central educational mottos. But uh, we actually do it a little differently, and I should probably explain why. When we teach classical history, in a, in a classical education program, the program will cover Greek history, it'll cover Roman history, it'll cover the history of the Middle Ages. Uh, these are the streams that, that come into um, to modern American civilization. Uh, by the way, very good book talking about how those are woven in together in American civilization. A great, great book by a guy named Russell Kirk, and it's called The Roots of American Order. And he traces the influence of the Greeks on us, the influence of Roman civilization on us, the influence of the medievals on us. Very, very helpful in understanding um, how we got to where we are. Um, but uh, let's say I was headed somewhere with that. What was it? Um, that's what, you have to be careful about digressions because you lose your train of thought, but but you want to do them because there's something important to say. So anyway, uh, so so we're talking about Roman. Yeah, so why we teach you the way we do We start with the Romans. Why do we start with the Romans? Because didn't the Greeks happen first? The reason we start with the Romans is simply because uh, Roman history structurally is easier to understand. You know, there's the Roman kingdom, there is the Roman Republic, and then there is the Roman Empire. And then the sort of Germanic period where things start uh, falling apart. Um, it, so the structure of, of Roman history is very easy. There's a lot more action. The Romans are um, action-oriented people. So there's a lot of battles, right? And um, uh, the stories are just better uh, and more easier for a younger child. So we start with Roman history. And then we move on to the Middle Ages, actually, is what we teach next, because that's probably the second most exciting uh, time of history, and then you get to the Greeks, and you know there's interesting, certainly interesting aspects to Greek history. But it is a little, you know, they're the Greeks are philosophers and playwrights, uh, but they do have their military history too, which is exciting. Um, and uh, but it, 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 in, in, in the way their history is laid out is very kind of confusing. You have to um, you have to think a lot more about it. So we just feel like it's better for them to start with something that's real clear. And we're working with timelines, we're working with maps, so chronologically, but um, just because history happened chronologically, it does not logically follow that it has to be, it can be, again, if that's, that's, if, if that's the tool you wanna use, that's fine, uh, but it doesn't have to be studied chronologically. It can be studied in a different order than it happened. You know, how it happened does not dictate how you study it. But again, that's, that's up to you. Uh, uh, there's there's a number of right ways of doing that. So um, I'm not uh, I'm not running down anybody who does it that way. I'm just saying there are other ways to do it. All right. Um, okay. Uh, I understand Paul Schaefer is telling me because I'm not seeing. Maybe there are, are posts coming and I'm just not seeing here. Uh, they want to know. They meaning you want to know the title of the Russell Kirk book again. All right. Here we go. Title of the Russell Kirk book again is "The Roots," R O O T S, "The Roots of American Order." The Roots of American Order. Uh, one of the best books on uh, on American um, uh, American civilization that I've certainly ever read. There's a kind of a shorter version of that, which is also an excellent book. The American cause. And he, you know, he says there's basically three orders in culture. He says there's a there's the political order, there's the economic order, and there's the moral order. 
uh, the, the, these 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 three aspects of any culture, and he talks about how that plays itself out in um, in American civilization. Um, all right, you haven't haven't seen any uh, questions on the YouTube thing, but again, you're welcome to post those so I can answer those. Um, otherwise, um, I'll just uh, cover maybe a couple other points. Um, I, I get the question a lot of times about um, technology. Um, what do we think about the technology in a classical education program? Um, Larry Cuban uh, wrote a book called Oversold and Underused. Oversold and Underused. Because, you know, you have parents come in and, well, do you have a, like, how do they learn how, you know, technology? And do you teach them, you know, computer language or HTML coding or anything like that? Um, and, you know, generally speaking, I will have to say <laughs> that um, at Highlands Latin School, where, where the classical core curriculum was developed, um, uh, this is not uh, this is not formalized, and it's sort of I'm I'm really sort of half joking, but we you know, we confiscated at the door, uh, and and all I mean by that is that we don't we don't use a lot of technology for certain things. Now there are three, Larry Cuban points this out. There are three reasons you use education technology. It's three three things you you could mean with that that term that expression. One is for administrative purposes, to keep grades. Uh, any kind of record keeping, uh, and that's no problem, uh, works fine. The second is instructional technology, technology that would be used not by the administration, but by the teacher in class. You know, uh, I find um, among the best pieces of education technology is the overhead projector. Um, it does just about anything you want to do. Now, some people, they want to do a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. That's fine. However, I will caution you on PowerPoint presentations. I've noticed this over and over again. And a friend told me that this is actually, uh, somebody mentioned this in a book about, about technology is the problem here. When you have a PowerPoint presentation with all kinds of slides, because the problem is that people are looking, they need a focal point. Well, it's either going to be you or the screen. And what happens in, in, in most PowerPoint presentations is people are confused as to which they're supposed to be paying attention to implicitly, and so they don't get it as well. Now, when I speak, I want people to pay attention to me, look at me, uh, and, and to have a, a screen up, unless it's, you know, really in a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I've also seen, uh, I was we were doing a tour of our school for some teachers from another school, and I walked into the classroom, we walked into the classroom and there was one of our teachers and she had her, her laptop, the projector was projecting onto the screen um, and she was showing them how to uh, use the citation uh, stuff on Word. No problem at all, no problem at all. But, but I think people think that just because technology is there, it automatically helps people. That's not true, okay? And this is particularly a problem, okay? I said, technology for administrative purposes. Technology for instructional, you know, instructional technology. And third, third is learning technology, what the student would be using, okay? And of course, what has happened is a lot of school districts have thrown iPads uh, out there. Um, the research, Larry Cuban suggests, is not good on this. It does, does not um, bode well for this kind of thing because one of the chief problems that modern students have is that they are distracted. So you have to ask the question, is throwing iPads at the situation going to make things better or worse? It's a question we all need to ask. Um, and um, it, not Larry Cuban, but somebody else has suggested that um, what the research shows on this is that if you have good self-disciplined students, it helps. If the student is not self-disciplined, which I, I wager is the majority of students, it actually hurts. It actually makes the distraction problem worse. They don't learn as much. Um, but you know, the, 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 the big problem in education technology is nobody's thinking it through. A uh, school district will get a grant to give everyone iPads and we're just gonna do it. We're not even thinking about um, uh, the real consequences to that. We're not looking at what the 
what the research really says about whether that's effective or not. So uh, I just thought I would throw that in here. Uh, we've got about four minutes left. If you have any uh, other questions, um, other than that, what about the Russell Kirk book? Um, let me let me talk about uh, in the final minutes, unless we get another question here, about books to read on classical education. Uh, I would say for for my money, the best book I've read out there. Okay, wait a minute. We do have a question here. Um, as an advocate of progressivism, did Woodrow Wilson have anything to do with the progressive education movement? Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I know that Woodrow Wilson, you know, they had a, a conference in 1917 at Princeton. The classical educators all got together because they were beset by all these progressives um, uh, um, demanding change. And so they all got together, uh, the pr president of Princeton in 1917 got, got all the classical educators together there, and they had this conference. And you can actually get the, um, the transcript of the talks that were given there um, uh, on, uh, yeah, um, on, uh, in a book called The Value of Classical Education. It's actually still in print and on a photostat print that you can get on Amazon. I got mine on Amazon. Um, it's got the, the, uh, transcripts of this, and they also called on a lot of famous people after that conference before they published that book to um, to submit the, uh, their own views on classical education. And Woodrow Wilson actually is in there. He he is one of the ones who who says good things about classical education. So um, I know he uh, Wilson was would be considered a political progressive, but I'm not sure that he was an educational progressive necessarily. But uh, but I would have to. Okay, also the question, uh, what is the title of Larry Cuban's book? It's Cuban, as, as in a person from Cuba. Larry Cuban. Uh, the title, again, is Oversold and Underused. Oversold and Underused. Uh, another question, how do you see progressive methods creep into classrooms whose school's intent is to educate classically? Well, teachers, how to teach classically. Um, very few great books you will encounter in a um, in a teacher training program. So everyone who's educated uh, to be certified uh, is is getting progressivism a, a, a daily. So so that that's that's one problem. Of them. And the other is just simply a lack of understanding. You know, it's it's why we're having this webinar is because a lot of us don't know what classical education is. And and I was going to say, but my, my best book for the money in classical education is a book, and I'll repeat it several times because that's most of the questions are, what, what are the books you, you recommended? Is Climbing Parnassus, P-A-R-N-A-S-N-A-S-S-U-S. -S -S -S. Do I have that right? Is Mrs. Bottenfield in the audience somewhere? Uh, she knows that one well because that's the name of her school. Um, but uh, Climbing Parnassus all right, is, the, is the main title. Now, you don't need to write down the subtitle, but the subtitle is an apologia uh, for Latin and Greek. In other words, a defense, it's a Greek word, a defense of teaching Latin and Greek. All right, and it is by Tracy Lee Simmons, S-I-M-M-O-N-S, -M -M Tracy Lee Simmons, Climbing Parnassus. Do you recommend teaching algebra one in eighth grade? Is geometry taught before algebra according to the liberal arts list? Um, I'm going to punt a little bit on that question. I'm, I'm sure that we've got somebody in one of the later web, webinars uh, that, that would, would be better in answering that question. Um, I think that at Highlands Latin, we do teach algebra one in the eighth grade. But at the same time, we have a very uh, sort of advanced program. Um, and I think that we do teach algebra, all the system of algebra. And the, 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 the distinction between algebra one and algebra two is 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 not a structural distinction in algebra. Uh, um, algebra is a is a is a system in and of itself, like geometry, like arithmetic. It's it's a system, uh, a what's called a logistic system. And uh, the only reason that you have algebra one and two is because it just takes longer than a year to learn the system of algebra. So we think it's better just to teach the whole system straight through rather than to have to come back and remind everybody of everything they learned in algebra one, two years later, um, or a year later after they finished anyway. Um, so, um, and I think that we, I, I may be wrong on this. Somebody, somebody have to correct me. I think we teach 
uh, geometry after algebra. Okay. So hopefully that partly answers your question. Did I it's geometry taught before algebra according to? Okay, yeah. Now that's our way. Now there are different ways of doing this, and and you know education was done differently at different times of history. So uh, you know, and algebra, algebra is a recent thing. I mean, you're talking about George Boole in the 19th century, basically is the biggest um, person contributing to the development of modern algebra. So really, you're not teaching algebra in schools till till really the 20th century. So it's hard to say how classically you would teach that because it's a, it, it wasn't around in classical times, wasn't around when classical education was being done for the most part. So it's just a matter of us having to decide how to do it. But we do try to keep algebra together because it is one subject. It's not really two parts. It's just learning the whole system of algebra. Okay, so hopefully that answers the question. All right, any more questions before we leave? I'm, I was given from 12 to 1 is my my time frame here. So hopefully this has been helpful to you in, in, in you know, I'm try, I tried to give you a little bit of historical context uh, in, in regard to classical education, and I tried to give you a couple of really good definitions and, and ones that you can use. Uh, again, the liberal arts and the great books is what we do um, so that kids will learn wisdom and virtue. Um, and, and I know that sounds just so lofty and an esoteric in a modern education context, but really, uh, we need to inform those words with meaning again, so that uh, so that we can uh, use them and people will understand them. 